Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity uh, to discuss uh, two very creative and interesting papers. Uh, Matt uses uh, moment inequalities to estimate parameters of, the, of a demand system, and uh, Frank is interested in uh, connectedness. And um, it's very hard to find relationship between the two papers, and I have to discuss this in 25 uh, minutes. So I was scratching my head, OK, so how am I going to put this together? And um, I also have a hard time trying to fit a theme of uh, prediction, since this, this is a session on prediction. So what I decide, what I decide to do is actually to um, uh, pick up on uh, Matt's uh, theme of doing dimension reduction. And I'm going to apply some of these methods to analyze uh, um, uh, Frank's data. Uh, and uh, Frank kindly shared his data for me. So um, in dimension reduction, I'm going to call it matrix, matrix uh, sketching. Uh, so we start off with a matrix A that is m by n. And I'm interested in a lower dimension matrix. And in this case, I'm interested in fewer columns, as in, in, as in Matt's case. I'm, um, I'm looking for, uh, for a sketching matrix uh, script S. So there are many ways to do it. And um, uh, a familiar way to do it is principal components, in which um, I try to find the number of directions in which the orig original data have uh, high variance. And if we do a principal component analysis, what we preserve is the average pairwise um, distance. And when we preserve the average, uh, we cannot avoid the fact that a few of these distances are going to be um, uh, particularly uh, large. Okay. So the advantage of doing uh, principal component analysis, and we're quite familiar with it, is that if we're willing to put in a factor structure, uh, we, can, we can develop asymptotic analysis and, and analyze uh, properties of this uh, principal components. And that's, that's all done. But um, the fact is that when we uh, do principal component analysis, even if we do a partial um, SVD, um, if the dimension of the matrix is large, we still have to compute all these eigenvalues. And that can be computationally uh, expensive, which is why um, uh, we might want to consider other alternatives. So the method that Matt's consider, uh, this random projections method, is a method that tries to preserve all um, uh, 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 um, to pairwise distance of, of points, uh, whereas uh, principal components try to preserve the average um, of the distance. Okay? So when we try to preserve um, each pairwise distance, we may actually sacrifice the overall uh, variance. So this is a slightly different criterion from doing principal components analysis. So this work on uh, random projections, um, the optimality criterion is not statistically based. It's, it was algorithmic based, so they derive these uh, worst case error bounds. So I must confess I have the same caveat as, as Matt. Um, all this stuff is, is self-taught, so there are lots of people in this room that know more than, more than I do. So, um, so this is the optimality criterion from an algorithmic perspective, which coming from an econometric perspective is a little bit hard to understand what they mean by worst case error bang and, and all that. Um, so when I first uh, started looking at this, I thought, well, when I think about a projection matrix, I was you know, teaching the hat matrix, and you, you, you get an item potent matrix, and you know, eigenvalues are either 0 or 1 and all that. Then I go into this random projection matrix. Well, it, th this notion of projection is a little bit different from, from my understanding of linear projection. So in the random projections um, case, this p prime p matrix is they don't have eigenvalues that is either 0 or 1. And, and the p, p matrix is, is approximately unit names and approximately orthonormal, even if you choose um, the, the values of p to be uh, either 1 or uh, minus 1. So, so to, to give you an, uh, uh, some informal arguments of this uh, random projection matrix, uh, one ma random projections method, what we want to do is to project um, m points um, from Rn into a low dimension Rk. So the most naive way to do it is to just uh, random, uh, randomly sample, uniformly at random. Why not, right? So we just want a fewer columns, right? So in fact, if we do it uniformly sample at random, it actually will work pretty well if, if the columns um, have, uh, they contribute to the overall variance uh, in a uniform way. Okay. But it's only in the case when the columns, when some columns contribute more. So in, 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 in Matt's example, um, looking at soft, uh, soft drink sales, right? If you uh, happen not to select Coca-Cola and Coca-Cola dominates the sales, right? Then your, your, your resulting sample is not uh, going to be very accurate. So, um, so, so it is in the case of non-uniformity that you want to have, uh, you want to consider ways other than uh, sampling uniform at random. Uh, so the idea of random projections is, OK, so, so unif lack of uniformity is, is the issue. So let's rotate the data. Okay, so uh, it is, it, the original data is not uniform. We rotate it 
from the original basis to a new basis. And in that new basis, the vectors are uniformly spread out. Okay? And once you rotate the data, then you can do uniform sampling. Okay? So, so that's the idea. Right? So, so, so the, how you rotate the data is, is, uh, is to choose some matrix that basically randomize the data. Okay? So you can start off with a, a matrix, um, this randomization matrix that is simply drawn from the normal distribution. But the, the normal distribution um, still gives you this S matrix, sampling matrix that is dense. Okay? So um, a better way to do it uh, computa computationally from a computation point of view is to have this sampling matrix to be sparse, which is the way that uh, Matt does it. So in that case, you just uh, choose a 1 or minus 1, 0, 1 or minus 1 uh, with certain probabilities. And uh, you can choose how, how sparse this matrix is. And it will, it will give you a random sampling matrix. And there are actually um, a large number of ways uh, to construct this uh, uh, sampling matrix. You can do count sketch, which is a little bit like a, um, uh, a Hadoop type um, algorithm. Okay? Um, and there are also known results of what this uh, sketching idea is going to give uh, for us. And it tells us that if we sample, loosely speaking, if we sample enough uh, columns, which is k, okay, and this k is going to be proportional to the log of the rows of the matrix, which is m, and your choice of the tolerance of, um, of the pairwise distance, deviation of the pairwise distance epsilon, um, uh, you, you can actually preserve this distance uh, um, uh, according to the uh, JL, uh, JL uh, lemma. Okay. The, the point here is that k, has, uh, k is logarithmic in M, and it does not depend on the original uh, columns. But the worst case error approximation does depend on this epsilon um, uh, that, uh, that we get to choose. So, um, so what I want to make a few uh, remarks here because what, what Matt is uh, doing is to apply these projections um, onto, um, into estimation. Okay? So um, uh, the projected data, um, they are combinations of the original data. So they actually have no interpretation. Um, do we care about this interpretation? Because in this case, um, we're interested in structural estimation. The more interesting uh, point uh, uh, from the econometrics point of view is that what is derived are these worst case error bounds from an algorithmic point of view. Okay? But what does that say about mean squared error? Right? So that what are the statistical properties um, of, of, of the beta hat that we construct from using this uh, subsample data? Um, so Matt's analysis is to use moment equalities uh, to, to, to do this estimation. And I, I am way behind, so I, I still am in the linear point identification. Well, so I'm going to go back to my OLS example, linear regression. Um, so instead of estimating uh, beta by OLS, I'm going to rotate the data by this S matrix. Okay? So, um, so actually, it is like our GLS estimation. right? So the, 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 the weighting matrix is simply uh, S prime S. Okay? So, um, so obviously, um, the, the, uh, the, this uh, projected uh, estimator um, is, is going to depend on the on the choice of weights. Okay? And there's some issues that we, we need to, well, um, I, I, at least I, I certainly don't understand, and we, 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 we may want to think a little bit about it. So it's a GLS type estimator. Those finite sample properties are not known because the weights are, the weights are random. Okay? Um, interesting to me is that GLS was developed to improve efficiency because we reweight the data according to um, the variances. So it reduces variance. Okay? But in this case, we reweight the data. We inject randomness into it. It actually adds noise um, to, to the estimator. Um, so along the lines of GLS, once we uh, reweight the data, so we, we might also want to think about whether uh, strict exogeneity actually holds, because we are re reweighting um, all the data. Is it, is it the case that the uh, weighted data um, uh, is orthogonal to the weighted um, errors? Um, Another, another thing we might want to ask is, what is the right criterion for think on, thinking about uh, how good this estimator is? Do we care about um, beta hat, or do we care about, care about y hat? So what is the right way um, to, to judge how good, uh, how good we, we, uh, th this, this estimator is? So there are lots of things uh, we don't know, and, then, um, and that uh, uh, um, uh, uh, requires um, uh, more work. So this is all in the, in the, in the case of point-identified models. Um, for set identification, um, I, I don't have uh, much insight on it. So, uh, so this is what the random projection uh, does. Okay? So, so the idea, to repeat myself, is that the, the original data is not uniform, 
uniform, so we rotate it to a new basis, and then we sample uh, uniformly. So are there any, any other ways to, to do this? Well, it turns out there is. There's an alternative uh, method that you actually, if you want k columns, you, you randomly sample exactly k columns right? instead of, so you get exactly k columns from the original uh, matrix instead of getting uh, combinations of the original data. And this is some, uh, a literature called uh, column, column selection, CSSP, forgot the total name of it. Okay, so, um, so I'm going to, uh, for, for, for the sake of analyzing uh, 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 Frank's uh, data, I'm going to now select rows instead of columns, so I just flip the matrix around. Um, so uh, the idea of this method is uh, you select rows uh, to capture the structure uh, of the left eigenvector of, of the original matrix. Um, so this may seem like totally unrelated to, to what we do, but actually um, we, we know it more, more, than, more than we think because um, these leverage scores, uh, which are defined to be the, the squares of the, um, uh, the square length of the left eigenvector, is nothing more than our good old hat matrix. Okay, it's actually um, a, a prime, a inverse a prime. And then you take the diagonal entries and that, that is actually what's called the leverage scores. Okay? So, the, so once you, but what, what, is, what is this head matrix? Well, we actually use it to do influential analysis. We use it to identify extreme observations. So what this sampling scheme does is actually define a sampling, this important sampling distribution based on these leverage scores. Okay? And we basically pick the columns that has the largest, in, uh, largest influence, and use, we use that to account for non-uniformity. Non okay? So we still pick uh, k columns, and in Matt's case, uh, uh, 300 columns, and but we, 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 get, we literally get a subset, subset of the columns, and uh, so in contrast to the random projections method, when you rotate the data and then sample uniformly, this method, you directly sample taking the non-uniformity into account. So it's just two different ways of dealing with the uh, problem, which is fundamentally uh, the lack of uh, uniformity. So, uh, so in this setup, uh, in this column se selection uh, literature, we actually know some results. And again, it's from an algorithmic perspective. We know that the uh, full sample estimator, uh, I'm again in the OLS a linear regression framework, this beta hat is going to deviate from this weighted um, estimator where the weights are selected according to the important sampling distribution. Um, it depends on a large number of things, but among which is actually the properties of, of X comes into uh, play. X has to has, have some uh, decent dispersion before we, we can get uh, good estimates. So, um, so the fact that we can show that the objective function uh, converges uniformly, uh, this pro uh, projected uh, objective function converges uniformly to the original objective function uh, might not be, um, might, might disguise some important uh, uh, um, characteristics that is required uh, of the estimator to be well behaved. I'm more interested in um, whether uh, on, 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 on the statistical properties of this uh, weighted estimator. And um, uh, the weighted estimator is actually a special case of, of the full sample estimator with the weights all equals to one. So if we do a Taylor series expansion of this estimator around the weights equals to one, we actually get, we can say something about this uh, weighted estimator. And this weighted estimator is, um, uh, is on average centered around uh, beta hat, the full sample estimator. But it also has a remainder term, and this remainder term actually depends on the sampling scheme. Right? So, um, so, so the, the, how, we, how we do the sampling process is not uh, entirely innocuous. Uh, so. Um, we, we make progress in, in figuring out how to use it, but there's still um, quite some ways to go before we understand uh, how uh, exactly what kind of uh, results we are getting uh, from this. So the one, one paper I'm aware of that analyzed these kind, uh, this particular type um, of uh, sampling procedure is a paper by um, um, uh, Bin Yu and, and, and Mike Mahoney. And what they show is that if an estimator that has desirable algorithmic properties, um, it, um, it may not translate into good statistical properties. Right? It, it may not do worse, but it's not doing any better. Okay? So a, an estimate that has proven to, be, um, uh, to have the best worst case error bound um, actually uh, may not do well in a mean square error sense. Okay? So I, I leave this as, a, uh, as an open question, what, what, um, how that translates into our more complicated um, estimation uh, problems.
OK, so, so, uh, so this random uh, sub subspace uh, projection sampling method, uh, just to summarize it, it's, uh, um, it is data oblivious, meaning that it can be applied to any data. Okay? It's, it's, it just, you just uh, rotate the data and you sample uh, uniformly. And at the end of the data, data you get are linear combinations of the original data. And in contrast, this leverage-based uh, score sampling, you take the head matrix, okay, so the, because it depends on the data, it is no longer data oblivious, but you do get back columns that belongs to the original data. Yeah. So, um, so there's still a lot to be learned about this. So instead, what I want to do is to take this, um, uh, this leverage-based sampling method. Um, I want to take a look at uh, Frank's data. Okay, so I want to do some dimension reduction and take a look at uh, Frank's data and see what, what I can learn. So I, I'm going to uh, look at four things. Okay, I want to take Frank's data, uh, who, who, who generously supply me the data in short notice. Um, I, I want to, um, uh, since I know nothing about this banking data, I, it's the first time I see today's, this data, I want to see what machine learning methods tells me about this data. Okay. So the first thing I tried, I throw it into R. And I asked it to give me three, uh, do k-means clustering, give me three, three clusters. Okay? So, so I really honestly know nothing about this data. And I stare at this data and I said, gee, I know nothing, but I recognize these, these guys. Right? Group, group one, so JPM, my wild guess, oh, JP Morgan. Right? BAC is Bank of America, C is Citibank, and that's Wells Fargo. Um, and then in the, the third row, first one, GS, that's Goldman Sachs. So I actually know all these, but what about the dot T's? Well, the dot T's, I happen to know too, because they're all the banks in headquarters in Toronto. Okay, so it is um, uh, Bank of Montreal, Bank of Nova Scotia, Royal Bank, TD Bank. Okay, so this first cluster is completely North American banks. Okay, um, I thought it was pretty neat. Okay, so then I look at the second quarter, uh, second cluster, and say, so, okay, what is this? Well, I, I, and then I figure, okay, what, what on earth is dot LN? And after a while, okay, that has to be London. Right, so in fact it is. Is um, we get Lloyds Bank, we get HS, uh, uh, HSBC, uh, we get BNP in France. So some of these nicknames are, are less familiar, but it it is pretty obvious. The second cluster is almost entirely European. So that's pretty cool. And so that is European. Okay. Then the third cluster, I look at it. Okay, so um, I was uh, again guessing well, what is TO? Well, TO turns out to be Tokyo. So um, then this third cluster, all the banks are actually from, mostly from Asia, um, almost, uh, a, a mix of Asia, Australian banks, and, um, and a couple Brazilian banks. Okay. So I asked for three clusters. Um, K means doesn't know what I throw it to you, and I was extremely impressed. I came back with three groups that actually make a lot of sense. And I thought, well, if I have this inf information, it might actually guide me how I do my modeling. Right? There's something about spatial structure I ought to be able to directly use um, information when I do uh, modeling. <coughs> okay, so I learned about these leverage scores. So I said, okay, let me take a look at these leverage scores. So I took Frank's data, um, and I compute the leverage scores in the time dimension. Okay? And they, um, so this is really the x, x prime, x in inverse x prime matrix, take the diagonal. And the higher the spike, the more contribution of that particular observation has to the total variance in the data. Um, I only, um, uh, so I don't know these dates, uh, but uh, so I Googled and there was a website that tells me all the dates of the financial crisis. And the top date that came up, came up was uh, 2008, 9, 18. And that turns out to be the day before TARP, which was a day after Lehman collapsed. So that, that, that makes sense. Okay, so. Um, and the second day was 2009, and that was the UK bailout, uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland. And the third, uh, third one was also related to uh, RBS. And uh, 2008-11, um, uh, November 21st, that was the Dow lowest uh, in six years. So I could find all this documentation uh, just from checking historical documents of went on, what went on. And the, and the fifth one was the, was the Chrysler, Chrysler um, bailout. So I thought, okay, this is, this is also pretty cool. If I just you know, look at this data, um, it, 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 it guides me. Then this is completely unconditional. I didn't do any, uh, any, any regression. So this is actually quite, quite in informative. This is just pure uh, data analysis. Um, I also look at the influential columns. Okay? So uh, the banks that contribute most of the variance in the data, well, Bank of America. Um, so uh, yeah, so um, 
I don't know enough about the banking data to read too much into it, but I do recognize these names that they have been problematic during the episode. Uh, so the third point, um, so the orange line is what uh, uh, Frank uh, showed uh, towards the end, which was the overall connectedness, is right? Okay. Um, so I thought, well, um, how do we distinguish connectedness from uh, common sources of variation, right? So uh, since I do factor analysis, I cannot resist doing a, doing a common factor. So this is my, the blue line is the common factor, okay? Um, so definitely it agrees with uh, Frank's um, conclusion that it is, uh, there's a strong, strong cyclical component um, in it and, and, and the, it peaks, uh, the spikes uh, agree pretty well with, with what, uh, what, what, what uh, Frank does. So that, that this raises the question, how do we, um, is it common factors and network effects that are not mutually exclusive, right? So how do we find a way to model um, connectedness and, um, and, and co-movements? Um, can, can we do this? This is more, more a structural analysis, but um, the data does seem to suggest, you know, uh, that, that both effects can be, can be there. Okay, so the last point I want to make is, I really like this uh, connectedness idea. And um, uh, it, it, so what Frank did was he run this VAR, okay, so for, for each uh, equation, uh, which is YIT, uh, he has um, I equals to 96 banks. Um, you have to run this regression, you have to do this regression on P legs of each bank. And there are many, many banks, so you have N squared times P uh, regressors on the right hand side, and that's, that's high dimension. So what he does, he used lasso uh, to do regularization and to make the, the phi of L matrix sparse. Okay? And then once you have the sparse matrix, um, then you put it in a VAR. Um, and for those of you who don't know uh, VAR, uh, you, 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 you have to find and identify, make some assumptions about this H matrix uh, to go from the reduced form model with, with those errors u into the, in, into the structural errors e. Okay? But when n is high dimension, this H matrix, which is n by n, is gigantic. And we need n times n over two restrictions. And when n is 90, uh, 96, you need a lot of restrictions, okay? uh, which, is, which is a bit hard. So I thought, well, can we, can we do better? So what, I, what I, I'll show you next is instead of doing regularization or doing the connectedness table um, from the residuals of, uh, of this guy, okay? I'm going to say, why, why don't we do this? Why don't we, um, instead of doing the connectedness by aggregating the rows of this uh, 96 by 96 matrix, why don't we aggregate before we do this regression? So what I do is this, I, for each variable i, I create a variable that excludes variable i. So I call it every, every, every other bank, because I call it collect them. Um, and now, instead of doing one gigantic VAR, I do n VAR, n pairwise VAR. Okay, so then um, my identification now is simply on this H matrix that is two by two, and um, the two and from, uh, 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 I still have the two and uh, from uh, measures of connectedness, but now that I do the dimension um, by um, making uh, the, this uh, yit variable, which is all variables exclude i, is now a scalar, but I now allow um, the coefficient matrix uh, to be dense. Okay? So I also get some connectedness. Um, the Royal Bank of Scotland, uh, which showed up early in the, um, in the uh, leverage scores, um, it has, it transmits more of its shocks to, to others and Citibank and Bank of America. And the receiver of all these, uh, of all the shocks in, in this analysis is actually HSBC and some banks in Australia and Deutsche Bank. So um, my point here is that when we have large dimension, we can do dimension at, at different levels. Um, we can do it, um, uh, uh, do the sparsity at the, at the estimation level, or we can compress the data, aggregate the data before we do estimation. So I think the, the point here can also be made for, for the first uh, analysis, maths analysis. In that analysis, um, we have, the issue here is that the, uh, the product space is really large, okay? but it's a, it's a one parameter model, it's a hom not one parameter, it's a homogeneous parameter model, right? So there's only one beta, one beta vector. So how many observations do you really need to estimate the beta, do we really need all the observations, right? So maybe we can also reduce the dimension. Um, do we need all the, all the observations, right? So, uh, so I think we, 
um, the, 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 the big data actually raises a lot of questions. How do, how do we want to use the, that information? 